speeches are first, will be followed by continued work on three appropriations bills rolled into one measure. Amendments are expected throughout the day, and we may see our first votes around noon Eastern. And now live to the Senate floor here on C-SPAN 2. Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barrett Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, you are surrounded by inaccessible light. Today, Help our lawmakers to make substantive progress in their efforts to keep America strong. Remind them to trust you for today's challenges and difficulties, knowing that you hold all our tomorrows in your hands. May this perspective of trusting the future to your powerful and loving providence, infuse them with a spirit of optimism to believe that they will reap a bountiful harvest if they persevere in doing what is right. Lord, give them the serenity to accept the things they cannot change, to change the things they should, and the wisdom to know the difference. We pray in your righteous name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and is all with liberty and justice for all. Clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., October 19, 2011 to the Senate under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Kirsten E. Gillibrand, a Senator from the State of New York, to perform the duties of the Chair, signed Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Madam President, are we on a quorum call? No. <clears throat> Madam President, I just want to make a couple of observations this morning about what's going on in Washington at the moment and what isn't. What's going on is that Democrats are obsessed, for some reason, with raising taxes. That's the only possible way to explain their latest idea to impose a permanent tax hike on about 300 U.S. businesses, business owners, and then use the money to bail out cities and states that can't pay their bills. That's the proposal we'll be voting on, apparently, tomorrow. Now, I don't know if our friends on the other side have noticed, but Washington can't pay its own bills right now. Think about it. The federal government spent $3.6 trillion last fiscal year, a new all-time record, and in the wake of the single largest spending year in history, Democrats want to put together another bailout. 
Add up the projected deficits of all 50 states this year, and you get $103 billion. That's all 50 states' deficits added up. Well, what about us? What about us here in Washington? We're expected to run a deficit of $1.3 trillion. Washington needs to prove it can get its own house in order before it starts demanding more money from job creators and throwing together another bailout. This is the third time in three years the President has asked us to bail out the states. How many more times? And how many more billions before someone realizes this is a very bad idea? More bailouts, more bailouts are not going to solve the problem. They'll just enable it. <clears throat> but the bottom line is this. Everyone knows the last thing you want to do in a jobs crisis is raise taxes. It's just common sense. The President himself has said as much. But for some reason, he's determined to keep trying anyway. And Republicans aren't about to go along with it. So Democrat leaders in Congress have decided to do nothing instead. If they don't get their tax hike, then they don't want to do anything at all. And that's why, rather than working with us on legislation that would get the government out of the way so the private sector can create jobs, including legislation that's in the President's own bill, they've choreographed a political sideshow this very week. Here's how it works. The President proposes a stimulus bill he calls a jobs bill. Congress rejects it in a bipartisan way for very sensible and straightforward reasons. The President then goes on a bus tour to criticize Republicans for voting against the so-called jobs bill. Democratic leaders consult with the White House on breaking the same bill into smaller pieces. And how do they break it up? By identifying parts they know Republicans will oppose, then add the tax hike just to make sure. Then another bus tour or a press conference with the President complaining about Republicans again. Repeat for 13 months in the hopes that Americans will forget that they're all now living under the economic policies that were enacted during the first two years of the Obama administration. And hope for success. That's the game plan. In other words, they're actually designing legislation to fail on the other side so they'll have someone else to blame for the economy 13 months from now. That's what's going on in the Senate this week. So what's not going on? What's not going on is the kind of bipartisan cooperation that Americans really want. My friend, the majority leader, is out there telling people the Republicans are rooting for the economy to fail. Nothing could be further from the truth. Look, if Republicans wanted the economy to fail, we'd all line up behind the President's economic policies rather than opposing them because they haven't solved this jobs crisis. We've been there, we've done that. The President got everything he wanted the first two years he was in office. So I think it's time Democrats realize that they were elected to lead, not to choreograph political theater. It's completely preposterous at a time when 14 million Americans are looking for a job in this country for the President to be riding around on a bus saying we should raise taxes. Completely preposterous for the President to be riding around on a bus saying we should raise taxes on the very folks who create jobs. Think about that. We've got 14 million people out of work and two self-identified conservatives for every liberal in this country, and the President's out there doing his best Howard Dean impersonation. He's completely out of touch. Let's forget about the tax hikes. Let's drop the talking points about millionaires and billionaires, and let's work together on bipartisan jobs legislation that's designed to pass, not designed to fail. Republican leadership in the House and Republican leadership here in the Senate has been crystal clear. We're ready to work with the White House on legislation we can all agree on. Two parties did it just this last week on trade bills. <coughs> there are other areas where we can do the same thing. The House voted on three bills this year, one as recently as last week, <coughs> to roll back excessive regulations 
by bureaucrats here in Washington that are destroying jobs and threatening to put even more Americans out of work. Now, all three of those House bills got solid bipartisan support. Why don't we have those votes in the Senate and show that we can work together to help businesses create jobs? Let's park the campaign bus, put away the talking points, and do something to address the jobs crisis. The American people want action. The election's 13 months away. Why don't we do what we were elected to do? Majority Leader. Following leader remarks, the Senate will be in a period of morning business for one hour. The Republicans will control the first half, and the majority will control the final half. Following that morning business, the Senate will resume consideration of H.R. 2112, which is the Agriculture, Commerce, State Justice, and Transportation Appropriation Bill. At noon, there will be a roll call vote in relation to the McCain Amendment regarding surface transportation. Additional roll call votes are expected during today's session. We hope to lock in an agreement on third, on the third, I, I'm sorry, on three district court judges, as well as the nomination of John Bryson to be Commerce Secretary. <coughs> Madam President, my friend, the Republican leader, and I'll talk in more detail in a few minutes, is complaining about attacks of one half of one percent, one half of one percent on people who make more than one million dollars a year to pay for a program that would stop teachers from being laid off and rehire some of the teachers that have been laid off. The massive layoffs we've had in America today have, of course, are rooted in the last administration, and it's very clear that private sector jobs have been doing just fine. It's the public sector jobs where we've lost huge numbers. And that's what this legislation is all about. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate, my friend, the Republican leader, is complaining about that. I would also note that my friend said the House passed another bill. Well, they passed lots of bills, but they rarely go anyplace. A report led by Henry Waxman of California longtime member of the House indicated last week that the House has voted 168 times to roll back regulations on clean air, clean water. Uh, these safeguards are important to have a healthier America. But the Republican response has been cutting back environmental and health safety safeguards. Yeah, I guess that hoping that a sicker more polluted country is a better place to create jobs, and it's not. Madam President, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the legislation that I moved to on Monday, dealing with, as I've indicated, maintaining jobs for teachers, firefighters, and police officers. Seventy-five percent of the Americans support this legislation. It's not a poll that some Democratic pollster did. It's a CNN Gallup poll. This week, my Republican colleagues have rallied against teachers and first responders. That's our latest proposal to create hundreds of thousands of American jobs and save other jobs. Republicans point to a similar program with a proven track record keeping 422,000 teachers in the classroom. Now, well, that's important. And they're using this as evidence that our programs are a failure. Now, Madam President, I know that the American Recovery Act saved Nevada from going into bankruptcy. The money that we got there, hundreds of millions of dollars, allowed the governor, Republican governor, to save Medicaid, that uh, money's fungible, it saved teachers, it saved a lot of programs in Nevada. So I say again, they call Democratic legislation, my Republican colleagues, my friend the Republican leader, legislation that created hundreds of thousands of jobs a failure. That's because they're using a different benchmark for success, for success than we are. 
Democrats' number one priority is to create jobs. There are 14 million Americans out of work today. So what us putting hundreds of thousands of people back to work, teaching children, have more police patrolling our streets, firefighters fighting our fires, doing the rescue work that they do so well. That's our priority. But it seems the number one priority of my Republican colleagues is to defeat President Obama. Their strategy is to keep the economy weak as long as possible. So they oppose legislation with a solid record of creating jobs. Never mind that Republicans have yet to propose a single idea on their own. A single idea on their own to get 14 million people working again. Never mind that in the past, they've supported every one of the job measures created that we've proposed. We have a bill, it was defeated, so we've taken pieces of that legislation. And virtually every piece of that legislation, Republicans in the past have supported. So it appears that Republicans suit up every day to come down here and come to work with the sole purpose of defeating President Obama instead of suiting up with the sole purpose of creating jobs. And they oppose the policies that will turn our country around for one reason and one reason only, to defeat President Obama. The famous author, Gore Vidal, said, and I quote, it's not enough to succeed, others must fail, end of quote. It seems that this is the Republican motto, this Congress. To me and to most Americans, putting politics ahead of this country's economic failure is important. We must put politics ahead of uh, most, uh, let's, let's start over, Madam President. I, most Americans, believe that putting politics ahead of this country's economic future is far outside of the mainstream. It's barely on the map. But that's where the Republicans have headed. Republicans have been very candid about the goal of this Congress. My friend, the minority leader, has said, and I quote, the single most important thing we want to achieve is for President Obama to be a one-term president. Close quotes. So defeating job-creating legislation, defeating the economy, and defeating the president, that's how the Senate Republicans measure success. But it's not how Republicans in the rest of the country measure success. The rest of America doesn't share those out-of-touch values. Like Democrats, the rest of the country believe that there are some things more important than politics, even in election year. Creating jobs is that most important thing. To Democrats and the vast majority of Americans, there's no goal more important than putting our economy so it's humming once again. That's why Americans overwhelmingly support our plan to retain or rehire more than 400,000 teachers and put more cops and firefighters doing the things that they do to keep our communities safe. In Nevada, this legislation will provide an additional $260 million to keep teachers in the classroom and maintain class size. It will support 3,600 jobs in my state and pump much needed money back into the economy. 75% of Americans believe we should help state and local governments put teachers, police, and firefighters back to work. And 76% of Americans agree the wealthiest people in this country should help get our country back on track. I repeat, three out of every four Americans, actually it's a little more than that, 76%, including two-thirds of Republicans, support the Democratic Teachers First Responders Back to Work Act. Republicans in Congress aren't just out of touch with America, they're out of touch with other Republicans. 54% of Republicans support the Democrats' plan to create job-building modern roads, bridges, schools. 58% of Republicans support our plan to extend the payroll tax for American workers and businesses. 63% of Republicans support our plan to put teachers in the classroom and police officers on the beat. 56% of Republicans even support our proposal to ask millionaires and billionaires to contribute their fair share, one half of 1%, to pull our nation out of this terrible recession. The trend is clear. Americans overwhelmingly support the Democrats' plan to create jobs, with even Republicans supporting our deals by, by our ideas by a wide margin. And yet, my friend, the Republican leader, said this yesterday on the Senate floor. There's growing bipartisan opposition to trying the same failed policies again. Again, he said, there's growing bipartisan opposition to trying the same failed policies again. 
and there is bipartisan opposition to raising taxes, especially at a time when 14 million Americans are out of work. Close quotes of my friend, the Republican leader. Well, Madam President, I say to my friend, the Republican leader, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not to your own facts. There is not. There is not bipartisan opposition to this legislation that will create and save jobs for teachers and first responders. On the contrary, there is bipartisan support for the legislation, and I've just gone over those numbers. Republicans, like the rest of Americans, do not oppose our proposal to ask millionaires to contribute their fair share. On the contrary, they support that proposal. One half of one percent surtax on million, people who make more than a million dollars a year. It's only here in Congress that Republicans oppose creating legislation and fair tax policy for the sake of politics. In the rest of the country, Republicans, like other Americans, are focused on where their next paycheck will come from and how they'll make their mortgage payment. And like Democrats, they're tired of Republicans in Congress rooting for the economy to fail instead of working with us to secure our economic future. Madam President, would you announce the business of the day? Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business for one hour, with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, with the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with the Republicans controlling the first half and the majority controlling the final half. Mr. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Madam President, I ask consent to call the quorum be terminated. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent that notwithstanding the previous emergency, to executive session be considered. The emergency intro. 272, 273, and 274. There will be 10 minutes for debate, equally divided in the usual forum. But upon the use or leading back of that time, Cal number 272 and 274 be confirmed. And the Senate proceed to vote with no intervening action or debate on Cal number 7, 273. 273. The motion to reconsider be considered made and laid on the table. There be no intervening action or debate. And no further motions be in order to any of the nominations. That any statements related to the nomination be printed in the record. That the President be immediately notified of the Senate's action. The Senate then resume legislative session with two minutes of, two minutes of debate equally divided between Senators McKee and Boxer or the designees. 
prior to the vote in relation to the McKean Amendment or 739 with all other provisions of the previous order remaining in effect. Without objection. Madam, I would note in absence of quorum, uh, I'm, uh, what we'll do, we shouldn't do this, but I'll go ahead and do this. And it's no, we can't do that. We have to do it. Let's, uh, so I would note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. But Madam President, under the, if I Majority note the absence leader. of quorum, whose time runs? It's on the Republican time. Because they're first and last, okay. Correct. I, w I would uh, note the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
So we are also in morning business. Correct. Um, Madam President, I would ask that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. And I would also ask that um, I be allowed to speak in morning business, although I believe we're in the Republican uh, time. Without would... objection. Okay. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I, in some ways I hate to come to the floor today and talk about this because I very seldom do this, but I am announcing to all my colleagues and to the administration that I'm putting a hold on all Treasury Department nominations uh, until I get something resolved. And let me back up and tell the story. Some of my colleagues are familiar with this story because this has come up a few times before um, and I've already spoken on the floor a couple of times about this, and certainly in the Homeland Security Com Committee I've spoken about this. A few years ago in Arkansas we had some floods. And um, in this one particular area around Mountain View, Arkansas, uh, some folks, some people's houses were flooded. FEMA came in. Um, they actually in one particular case in the Guglielmanas case, which is a family there, um, they talked to this couple. They're on Social Security. They talked to this couple about how they're entitled to some FEMA recovery money to repair their home. The FEMA was actually in the home, took pictures, helped them fill out the paperwork, walked them through the entire process. They ended up getting $27,000 dollars in this FEMA uh, money <clears throat> for disaster recovery. Absolutely, the, the Google Amanas did everything absolutely by the book. Uh, they followed all of FEMA's direction. They did it exactly picture perfect, exactly the way you would think all citizens should conduct their business. Then, three years later, they get a notice in the mail, and FEMA says, oh, we messed up. We, didn't, we shouldn't have given you that money because of some technical reason, and because of that, um, we now want all that money back. Well, they've worked a great hardship on this family. You know, this is supposed to be government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That's not what has happened in this case. This has worked a great hardship on this family. There are lots of community efforts around these floods, local civic clubs, churches, just the community at large rolled out to help people. The Google Manas said they didn't need that because they had FEMA's help. So they have 
foregone a lot of local assistance, a lot of charity assistance, just a lot of just general help from their friends and neighbors because of FEMA. Now FEMA has come back and said, you owe us the entire $27,000. This could ruin them financially. And um, I've met with the FEMA director, Fugate. Um, he and I have had very, what I would think of as productive conversations, although this matter hasn't been resolved. One of the things we talked about is to get an amendment to the existing statute. Uh, we're working on that. We're working that uh, bill through the uh, system right now in the Senate. Um, to work with colleagues on the Homeland Security Committee and also the Appropriations Committee. I'm not saying that we would have a unanimous agreement on my approach on that, but certainly I've been trying to work with this and work with anybody here in the Senate to make this bill better. Unfortunately, what has happened in the last few days is FEMA has now taken the additional step of turning this matter over to the Department of the Treasury for debt collection. They've turned it over to Treasury for debt collection. To add insult to injury and to rub salt in the wounds, this $27,000 debt, now with fines and penalties and interest, has gone to $37,000 in debt. $37,000 in debt that these folks were assured by the government that they were completely entitled to because this was flood recovery and the only reason they're not entitled to it is because of some technical issues that FEMA should have recognized from day one. They should have never offered to help these people, but what they've done is they've now caused them great injury. So, Madam President, this is really a matter of equity and fairness, and I think at this point, what I would say is enough is enough. You know, we've been talking to FEMA for months about this. Now Treasury's involved. Enough is enough. We need to get this resolved for this family and maybe a few others. And it's not just localized in Arkansas. You're going to see this happen over and over and over around the country because FEMA has a backlog of these cases. It's a long story. They got tied up in litigation for a few years. But nonetheless, there's a backlog of these cases. And I can almost guarantee you that virtually every senator in this chamber at some point is going to have to deal with this. So I would hope that um, you all would uh, listen to what I'm saying and hopefully help me uh, get this resolved. But that's why, Madam President, I'm putting a hold on all the Treasury nominees. We need to get this resolved. And we, we're going to do whatever it takes to get it resolved. And we want to resolve this situation fairly uh, for this family in Arkansas. And again, they're just the first of many, many that you're going to see uh, that have this same type problem. FEMA's done them harm. Our government has done them harm, put them at a disadvantage. And uh, there's a, uh, a principle in law called detrimental reliance. These people clearly relied on the government, relied on FEMA to their detriment. And they're paying the price, paying the penalty for that now. And like I said, when the IRS and Treasury gets involved, there's penalties and interest. And uh, just American citizens should not be treated this way, especially those that are playing by the rules and really don't have any other recourse. So, Madam President, that's all I wanted to say in my morning business. And I see that we have several here to, to talk on, on other matters. So uh, before I close, I just want to say I am putting Treasury on notice that I'm going to hold all of their nominees until we sit down and work through this and hopefully get a good, fair result for this one family in Arkansas. Madam President, with that, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Nebraska. Madam President, there's been a lot of talk about how we uh, go about rebuilding infrastructure after recent disasters and how we assist struggling states to accomplish that goal. Many in this body do not believe the federal government should borrow money uh, in an attempt to bail out states. We have our own financial mess uh, right here at the federal level that citizens across this country are saying, rightfully so, we've got to get solved. But we can all agree that one of the best things that the federal government can do is get out of the way, cut through the red tape. We must remove federal hurdles, the barriers, There's so much uh, cumbersome process that constitutes the largest barrier to rebuilding our infrastructure. 
In fact, I'm very pleased to rise this morning and report that there's language in the appropriations bill that I believe should get unanimous uh, support in this body. It's part of the transportation section. It simply says that states may rebuild their roads and their bridges that have been damaged in disasters without having to repeat environmental study after study. Gosh, what a common sense solution. Keep in mind we're talking only about replacing roads, roads and bridges that have already been through process, that are already there, that were carrying traffic before the disaster. And what we're saying is the most practical thing you could possibly say, and that is no need to repeat the expensive studies, the time-consuming studies. Let's get out there and let's help the states get the work done. In other words, it saves states time and money by cutting through red tape and allowing them to just very simply rebuild their roads, roads and bridges. Now, I personally want to commend the senior senator from the state of Nebraska, Senator Nelson, for authoring this language. It's a common sense approach, something we're used to in the Midwest, and it doesn't add a dime or a dollar to the federal deficit. This language, as I said, should receive unanimous bipartisan support especially from every senator who, whose home state has been hit by disaster and literally as I speak, our state is trying to figure out how to recover. Now, notwithstanding the fact that I think most people would agree that this is so common sense, my colleague from Washington State, Senator Murray, has an amendment that would strike this language. I can't imagine why this body would stand in the way of states trying to rebuild their roads and bridges. In fact, in addition to states, Senator Nelson's language would help counties and communities that are so cash-strapped with so limited uh, tax base, and it's saying, we'll help them too. For local authorities, the cost of repeating environmental studies is crushing. Even President Obama has called on his administration to drop unnecessary regulations and to look for red tape to cut through. Senator Murray's amendment, in all due respect, would do exactly the opposite. Her amendment would dig our bureaucratic hills into the sand and it would say to states and communities and counties, we know that you've been struggling. We know that you've been hit hard by disaster. But we are not going to keep our expensive hurdles squarely in place. We're going to force you to jump over each and every one of them. The language authored by my colleague, Senator Nelson, is a common sense way to remove these federal hurdles. I received assurance just this morning from the Department of Roads in my home state that this language would clear the way for several rebuilding projects in Nebraska, but we're not alone. I'm guessing road departments across this country would say the same. There's little doubt in my mind that it would do the same for other states that have been faced by disasters from the Midwest to the Northeast. We should rally behind Senator Nelson's language and make sure that his efforts to clear a pathway for recovery are not blocked by the Murray Amendment. I encourage my colleagues to vote against the Murray Amendment to stand with me on the side of cutting red tape and preventing states from rebuilding roads and bridges. Madam Chair, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from South Dakota. Madam President, um, I rise today to speak to, uh, to an issue that I think has been on the minds of um, uh, a lot of uh, people here and hopefully people across this country too, and uh, that is this uh, failed class act program, which uh, last week we finally got some, I think I would characterize it as good news because I think this is a program that was destined to fail. Uh, but on Friday last week, uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, Kathleen Sebelius came out and said, despite our best analytical efforts, I do not see a path forward for class implementation at this time. 
And it, essentially what came with that, what accompanied that, was a big volume of analysis that had been done that essentially supports that conclusion, that it just doesn't add up. You can't make the math work. And, and, I, and I think that's something that um, hopefully my colleagues, as we now, what we know now, will recognize that we ought to eliminate, we ought to repeal this class act once and for all. Uh, you know, that's something I tried to do as we were debating the health care bill uh, almost two years ago now. I offered an amendment in December of 2009 that would repeal the class act, uh, believing at the time that it wasn't going to work. And we had plenty of, at that time, evidence uh, to that effect. Unfortunately, it was included as a part of the health care reform bill to help pay for it. At that time, it was estimated that it would uh, generate about $70 billion in revenue to be used to offset the cost of the health care bill, or at least to put it in balance and to claim that there was some deficit reduction associated with it. Uh, now, the, uh, I think the, the, the more recent estimate of what it would generate in terms of revenues in the early years is, is on the order of about $86 billion. But we have all, those of us who have been skeptics about this program, uh, suggested from the very beginning that this wasn't going to be the case, that this was in fact a budgetary gimmick, that it was going to saddle the nation with additional debt. That was what Congressional Budget Office concluded as you got into the out years. Uh, when these premiums came in, there was going to be some revenue in the early years, but when you got to the out years and the demands on the program started to come in, that it just didn't add up, and it was going to add significantly to the federal deficit. Well, uh, I think that's a conclusion now that's been drawn even by those who supported the program, and so my, my th thinking at this time is that we as a Senate and hopefully the House of Representatives ought to move to repeal the Class Act once and for all. Uh, we shouldn't leave this thing on the books and allow it to, to become an opportunity at some point in the future for someone to say, well, we ought to try and, try and uh, reactivate this thing or implement this thing knowing full well uh, that it doesn't work. And so, um, you know, there were lots of warning signals along the way that were ignored. There were repeated warnings by the actuary and the administration that this wasn't going to work, which were ignored by uh, the Obama administration and their push to pass health care reform. Uh, it's, it's really interesting to me. We did a report not that long ago. There was a working group that examined this, and the report was called Class's Untold Story. Uh, it was uh, myself, some of my colleagues here in the Senate, some of our House colleagues that requested it, and delved into a lot of the email traffic that had occurred prior to its inclusion in the health care reform bill, and came across a number of things, a number of warnings that were issued by the HHS actuary. The chief actuary predicted at the time that this would result in an insurance death spiral. He said this could be a terminal problem for this program. The program is intended to be actuarially sound, but at first glance, this goal may be impossible. The resulting substantial premium increases required to prevent fund exhaustion would likely reduce the number of participants, and a classic assessment spiral or insurance death spiral would ensue. That was in May of 2009. May of 2009, that warning was coming from the actuary at HHS. Well, you went, the time, some time passed. This continued to be a part of the, the discussion with regard to the health care bill and it come to August, or July of 2009, and that actuary went on to say, and this was again after additional analysis, review, examination of this particular proposal, that 36 years of actuarial experience lead me to believe that this program would collapse in short order and require significant federal subsidies to continue. Madam President, that it would collapse in short order. That was what was said by the HHS actuary in July of 2009. And so they continued to plow forward thinking that somehow this was going to, again, uh, they were going to be able to salvage this program, figure out a way to make it work. August and September time frame of 2009, the actuary again says, I know, as you know, I continue to be convinced that the class proposal is not actuarially sound. That was the advice, the expert advice that was given to the administration about this proposal uh, way back in 2009, and yet they plowed ahead and in December of 2009 added it to the health care bill, uh, assuming again that it would help offset the cost of that health care legislation. And at the time when many of my colleagues here on the floor got up and talked about what a great program it was and how it, all was gonna, it was all going to pay off and this was all going to balance out. We had people say that it was a critical program, that it was a breakthrough program, that it was a win-win. Uh, we had Democrats come over here and, and uh, talk about the virtues of this program. I believe knowing full well that there were questions about it. Now, having said that, there was a big push on at the time to pass health care reform. And as a consequence, this uh, piece of 
that reform was included in there, notwithstanding our efforts to, uh, to repeal it or to strike it at the time. And so we went forward. Well, here we are now, 18, 19 months later, and full recognition uh, of the fact that this does not pencil out. It does not, does not add up. The math flat doesn't work. So where do we go from here? Well, in my view, what we ought to be doing is repealing this bill, which is why it seems mystifying to me that the administration is now suggesting that if Congress were to repeal the Class Act, that they would, he would veto uh, the, the repeal bill. And, uh, you know, you've got uh, all, this, all this actuarial data, you've got all these statements, you now have all this analysis that's been done that demonstrates uh, the very point that we were making at the, at the uh, initial consideration of this, and that is that it just wasn't going to work. And so I would hope and I would invite uh, my colleagues here on both sides of the aisle to join me in the effort to repeal this legislation. I introduced a bill along with Senator Graham back in April uh, of this year that would repeal the Class Act. It has 32 co-sponsors. Uh, I hope we can get enough co-sponsors here in the Senate to where we can put an end to this thing uh, once and for all. And so we're going to be looking for opportunities to do that in the, uh, in the, in the weeks and the months ahead uh, because, as I said, Madam President, this is something that clearly uh, does not work. It has now not only has uh, all the, uh, the arguments that were being made at the time prior to its passage, but subsequent to its passage, all the analysis that's now been done uh, comes to the same conclusion, and that is the numbers just don't add up. Now, what does that mean for the future of long-term care? I would submit that there are other things that we should do. I don't think that this is an issue that's going to go away. We have more people who are living longer in this country. Long-term care is a very serious issue. But going about it and trying to fix it in a way that would burden future generations with more and more mountains of debt, pile on their backs the cost of this thing uh, over time is the wrong way to go about it. And that's exactly precisely uh, what this particular approach would do. Uh, we've had many discussions about various remedies for the long-term care issue. Uh, we will continue to put our ideas forward in hopes that we can address it as part of some bill that would, uh, that would take a look and examine these issues, but do it in a way that is fiscally responsible, that's fiscally sound, uh, that is actuarially sound, and that doesn't create the massive amount of, of borrowing, the massive amount, massive amount of debt, and, uh, and put in place a flawed pro program that we knew uh, at its inception was not going to work. And so, Madam President, I hope that, that uh, we will uh, put an end to this thing, that we can get colleagues on both sides to agree to that, that we'll be able to add co-sponsors uh, to that piece of legislation and look for the first opportunity to repeal this legislation and make sure that we, uh, we, we end it once and for all, knowing full well that this, is a, this was an ill-conceived and ultimately would be a failed program. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Kansas. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I ask unanimous consent to address the Senate for up to 10 minutes. Without objection. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm here today as we debate H.R. Uh, 2112, the Agricultural Rural Development Food and Drug Administration and Related Agencies Appropriation Act, to address a particular provision uh, that, uh, in, in my view, that uh, is a provision that needs to be addressed within this bill. Uh, I also hope to have uh, the opportunity later today to offer an amendment uh, regarding the watershed rehabilitation um, uh, program uh, and to allocate some additional funds for that program and hope to have the chance to speak dur during the debate on this bill on the proposed school lunch uh, regulations uh, that the senator from Maine has so uh, appropriately addressed uh, previously. But at this time, I'd like to, to, to turn attention to a, a problem with the pending legislation. And that is its failure to address the proposed rules titled Implementation of Regulations Required Under Title 11 of the Food, Conservation, and Energy Act of 2008, Conduct in Violation of the Act, commonly known as the GIPSA Rule. Uh, this proposed rule has the potential to adversely affect livestock producers in my state and around the country, as well as consumers uh, of, of meat products. Uh, the House included a funding limitation in on implementation of this rule in its appropriation bill uh, that is not included in the Senate version of the bill. I am a member of the Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee uh, and uh, believe that uh, in this case the House uh, is correct. Uh, initially this rule that the Department of Agriculture is proposing grew out of the 2008 Farm Bill. As a member of the House of Representatives back then I was a member of that conference committee uh, that developed that Farm Bill 
and it directed the Department of Agriculture to issue regulations in five very discrete areas. Uh, in June of 2010, uh, the Department of Agriculture responded with the issuance of its proposed GIPSA regulations that uh, clearly went way beyond the mandate of that 2008 Farm Bill uh, and, under, uh, and way beyond the Department of Agriculture's uh, authority under the Packers and Stockyards Act. Uh, the GIPSA rule as written uh, is exactly the type of burdensome regulation that was the focus of our President's uh, January 18th uh, executive order. Uh, in addition to the executive order, the President promised to have a very transparent and open administration in regard to the development of rules. Unfortunately, the process surrounding the GIPSA rule has been far from transparent. Uh, this rule was proposed with zero, zero economic analysis from the Department, despite the major impacts it could have on the agricultural economy. For months, USDA denied this to be an economically significant rule. Uh, until multiple private uh, studies uh, showed an overwhelming comment from agriculture producers and others uh, like those in my home state of Kansas, uh, they finally convinced uh, the USDA that this rule would indeed have a significant economic impact and private analysis at that time indicated that these GIPSA regulations, if finalized as proposed, would cost the U.S. meat and poultry industry uh, nearly a billion dollars. So under the pressure, uh, the Department of Agriculture is now conducting this economic analysis. And while I certainly welcome that economic analysis, I am very concerned about whether this analysis will be made public before a final rule is announced and whether the public will be able to comment uh, and able to analyze and comment on, that, uh, on the data and the method methodology of, uh, used by USDA to complete that study. In fact, I've asked the Secretary of Agriculture in, uh, in our hearing, uh, in our Appropriations Subcommittee hearing, if he would release that economic analysis um, before the comment period concluded or open a comment period after the analysis is complete so that people can make comments based upon what the economic analysis demonstrates. Uh, and uh, certainly, in my view, the Secretary failed uh, on a number of occasions to, to answer my question. Uh, and give me that commitment that the process will be open and transparent and a comment period will occur. Uh, I sincerely believe it's incumbent upon this Congress to exercise its oversight discretion and direct the necessary transparency through a thoughtful analysis that, uh, that USDA to date hasn't provided. Uh, the public must be allowed time to study and comment on the data and the methodology, uh, and we need to make sure that we get uh, these rules right if they're going to be uh, implemented. It would be irresponsible not to adjust the rules to mitigate any negative economic impacts determined by the department's own economic analysis. Uh, as I mentioned, the House included a provision uh, barring funding for the current proposed GIPSA regulations, uh, and uh, USDA should, should be stopped, should be delayed uh, from going forward until it can limit itself to the five areas set forth in the Farm Bill, its, its congressional authority. Uh, and until uh, public comments can occur regarding that economic analysis, uh, we ought not have a final rule without the benefit of the economic analysis. The Department of Agriculture should not just be going through the motions because, uh, the, because there was insistence that economic analysis occurred. We need to be able to mitigate any negative impacts that we learn from that economic uh, analysis. Uh, and so, uh, Madam President, I appreciate the opportunity at this point in the day to address an issue that uh, is appropriate as we discuss the Agricultural Appropriation Bill uh, throughout today. Uh, and I look forward to being back on the floor uh, later today to uh, offer an amendment uh, to that bill regarding watershed rehabilitation and also at that time to speak in regard to uh, some what I view as uh, some crazy ideas that are proposed uh, school lunch program uh, uh, regulations. And I thank uh, the, uh, the President of the Senate for the opportunity to speak. Madam President. Senator from Maryland. Well, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, today I rise to remember the 10th anniversary of the anthrax attacks on our country. During the weeks following the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2011, our nation was exposed to chemical warfare for the first time. Two anthrax attacks were delivered through our country's postal system. The first 
set of letters was mailed to media outlets, including ABC, CBS, NBC, the National Enquirer, and the New York Post in September. Three weeks later, two other anthrax letters were mailed to the United States Senator, Senator Daschle and Senator Patrick Leahy. The letter to Senator Leahy never made it to Capitol Hill. The envelope addressed to Senator Daschle, however, was opened on October 15th in the Hart Senate Office Building in the mailroom of the office I use today. Emergency responders rushed to join Capitol Police to evacuate, evaluate the situation and determine the extent of contamination. Ten years ago this week, on October 17th, 2001, the Capitol was evacuated. At that time, I was a member of the House of Representatives. I remember the fear and trepidation all Americans felt in the days and weeks following September 11th. I take this time to honor the courage of our nation's federal employees. Two made the ultimate sacrifice, dying from the exposure of the deadly anthrax toxin at the postal facility that handled all the mail that came to the Senate in the House offices. United States postal workers Thomas L. Morris, Jr. and Joseph P. Corsine, Jr. gave the ultimate sacrifice after being exposed to the infected Senate mail while they worked in the Brentwood Post Office facility here in Washington, D.C. Mr. Morris and Mr. Corsine were Maryland residents. Like so many other federal employees, they went to work every day, serving the American people and trying to earn a living for themselves and their families. But less than a week after being exposed to the deadly anthrax at the mail facility, both men died of their exposures. The Brentwood Postal Facility, which was shuttered for months while the building was disinfected, now proudly bears their names, honoring two federal employees who died doing their jobs. Literally thousands of other federal employees bravely went back to work, making sure our government continued to function in the most uncertain of times. While most federal workers crammed together in small makeshift office space, other brave federal employees put themselves in harm's way, trying to contain the spread of the weaponized spores and to clean up the deadly bacteria. It has been fashionable of late to criticize the Environmental Protection Agency, but I remind everyone that members of EPA's Region 3 led the emergency response efforts following the anthrax attacks. They were joined by a small army of other EPA emergency responders from around the country who responded to the call for extra personnel to manage the massive detamination efforts. EPA's headquarters staffers were fully engaged as well. The EPA National Pesticide Program worked quickly to develop new methods necessary to wipe out the anthrax. Scientists worked primarily out of EPA's National Pesticide Lab, which is located just 20 miles away in Fort Meade, Maryland. It was not just EPA employees who answered the call to duty. The Capitol Police were the first ones to respond, and they continued to provide protection to legislative branch employees as well as the emergency responders and the public. The Department of Defense lent its expertise. As the cleanup progressed, thousands of tests were taken and then sent to Fort Detrick in Frederick, Maryland, where, capital, where ca chemical weapons specialists analyzed samples and reported results to the emergency command center. Defense Department personnel were also engaged in the actual decamination efforts, working side by side with EPA emergency responders. The photos that I brought to the floor today show some of these emergency responders wearing specialized protective gear, working on the decamination of Senator Daschle's office. Each desk, chair, filing cabinet, piece of paper in the office was removed. The last item to be removed from the room 509 of the Hart Building was an American flag that hung in Senator Daschle's front office. Emergency responders are seen here folding the flag before it. It was placed in a special sealed bag and then sent off to be detaminated. Countless employees at the Sergeant of Arms, the architect of the Capitol, the Senate, and the House staffers continue tending to the business of running our government and the legislature. It was critical that Congress continue to function, demonstrating to the nation and the world that terrorist attacks could not cripple the institution of democracy. 
Other federal employees put themselves in harm's way during and after the anthrax attacks. These federal employees worked hard to do what many thought impossible, putting public buildings back into use after a chemical attack. At great risk to themselves, they bravely met the challenges to ensure our government continued to function. Madam President, today I honor the memory of Thomas L. Morris, Jr. and Joseph P. Corsine, Jr., who gave their lives while engaged in public service. Today I salute those federal employees who risked their own lives that the legislative branch of the greatest government on the earth could continue and those who continue to work every day in the face of grave danger and uncertainty. And today, I simply wanted to give a heartfelt thank you to all of America's federal work employees. You, re you recognize that public service is an honorable calling, and your work every day to keep this nation the great nation it is. With that, M M Madam President, let me once again thank our federal workforce for what they do for our country, and I would yield the floor. Before yielding the floor, Madam President, I have eight unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. They have been approved by the majority and minority leaders. I ask unanimous consent that these requests be agreed to and these requests be printed in the record.